I think so that we get started on time, let me um, uh, take the pleasure to introduce Achen. Um, Achen uh, Browink is a um, engineer and he focuses on advanced technology in human perception. He has a special interest in computational perception uh, via the use of um, artificial intelligence. He's authored over 200 publications, including two books, and he has 37 issued patents. Uh, he wrote a book, interestingly, um, called The Natural Human Interface Technologies and Interactive Displays. Um, his current position is as the Chief Technology Officer and Executive Vice President of Engineering at Starkey Hearing Aids. And because, although he's going to be talking in a non-commercial way, but because he has that position, we can't offer CME tonight, uh, just as a technicality. Um, at Starkey, he leads the effort to transform hearing aids into multifunctional wearable health devices with advanced sensors and artificial intelligence technology. Prior to being at Starkey, Achen was at the Intel Corporation where he was the vice president and headed the perceptual computing group. He was over lots of interesting areas like 3D sensing, uh, interactive computing, computer vision and artificial intelligence, autonomous robots and drones, at drones and, and immersive uh, virtual and merged reality. He's taught in the engineering programs at both UC Berkeley and Stanford and you should all know, he is now an adjunct professor in our otolaryngology department at Stanford and is a collaborator in research we're doing. He and I plan to lead a course we, which we have on the program uh, for next fall, uh, which will be a course for graduate and undergraduate students and medical students mm -hmm. called Augmenting Human Senses, Enhancing Perception by Technology and Bioscience. So I wanna welcome Achen. He is in fact a member of the departmental family. And for those of you who've not met him, I know he would be delighted to spend some time getting to know people and hearing about particularly their engineering and AI related um, research. So thank you for joining us today, Achen. Look forward to hearing your talk. Well, thank you all for the fantastic uh, introduction. So I would say I'd get started. Do you see my screen, the first slide, the title slide? We do. Oh, all right. So uh, Rob already explained very nicely my background. And I borrowed a slide from my days at Intel. So I was there for 17 years. And I had the pleasure of creating and leading a team called a group called Perceptual Computing, where I was the vice president and general manager. A lot of good collaborations with Stanford as well, but mostly on the engineering side. And I had the opportunity to partner with neuroscientists. So this is really. Uh, the engineer's dream to, to partner with neuro, neuroscientists to take a bit of a deeper look at how the human perception, perception works because we aspire to build machines and systems uh, based on that understanding. Uh, and it's not just artificial intelligence that we all uh, claim inspired by biology more and more, particularly the way that we are architecting deep uh, learning uh, frameworks, but also sensors. How do we hear? How do we see uh, sensory motor systems? But after, after spending a lot of time on developing systems and machines that would perceive somewhat like, somewhat like humans and be autonomous, such as autonomous cars, robots and drones that could navigate and fly by themselves, um, I really wanted to devote uh, my time and uh, my full attention to medical applications specifically instead of focusing on making machines and uh, computers smarter, how do we help sense and perceive the world better? So you can call uh, that uh, midlife crisis, uh, which is what the Intel CEO called when I announced at Intel in the middle of 2017 that I'm leaving to join a privately held medical device company to push the frontiers of sensation devices that help improve human perception. And I have to say, you know, the with like a lot of you, uh, I uh, had the desire to work on devices that go into the ear. Uh, as computers have moved from mainframes to desktops to laptops to smartphones in your pocket to wristwatches, it's fairly very clear that the next frontiers are devices that will be inside the ear. And they will help you communicate better. They will uh, sense physiological information and keep us healthy. It was pretty interesting when I first met with uh, Rob because I, I came excited to talk to him about what is, it, what is it that I was going to develop and 
um, it was in, in, our, in our engineering works. And we, he couldn't stop sharing his vision about what in-ear devices could become and the potentials. And pretty much we were finishing each other's sentences. So I'm really excited uh, to get the opportunity to partner with a lot of you. Uh, and I've had uh, very, very nice uh, conversations with a number of faculty members. And I'm going to uh, share some of the work that you're doing now, which is opening up finally the opportunity to collaborate on uh, areas that I believe are going to transform uh, some of these devices and the benefit that they extend to uh, the users. So with that disclosure, so I think uh, Rob already highlighted, uh, I'm as proud as I am about joining the faculty as an adjunct professor. As a full-time job, I lead the research, development, and engineering at Starkey. I also volunteer for Starkey Healing Foundation. For uh, many of you know about Starkey, so we are a privately held company. So none of the uh, baggages that come with being a public company with uh, stocks trading in Wall Street. We have more flexibility about partnering with academia to develop uh, technology without getting bogged down by uh, usual barricades that uh, in a large public companies that I've been in the past uh, suffer from. I also serve on a few boards that I believe none of that is really conflict as far as my uh, collaborative efforts with uh, the department of Stanford. I should uh, uh, tell you a bit about the pictures on the right. So the, the people on, in, in blue shirts, so that's me on the right uh, in uh, Inner Mongolia on a, a foundation mission with Starkey. Uh, and my son on the left, my left and my daughter on the lower left. And we, were, we had the pleasure of helping something around 4,000 uh, people in Inner Mongolia who could not afford to uh, get hearing aids. Uh, they were all having hearing losses ranging from moderate to severe to profound hearing loss. And it was a life-changing experience there, uh, being able to provide people with, uh, with the services. We had two weeks of uh, extremely rigorous uh, missions there and helping people. The gentleman in, on the bottom right in white is the founder and owner of Starkey, Dr. Bill Austin. Um, and he's the reason I got uh, so passionate and uh, uh, excited about uh, joining this company. He devotes his, his, his life in, uh, in missions these days in philanthropy, whereas we get to work on the technology side. So with that, uh, the topics that I would like to cover today, and I'm gonna fly by some of these things because uh, you're deeply familiar with most of these topics. I'm going to slow down and talk about the technologies, which is what uh, the theme of this presentation is. But I'll touch on the prevalence of hearing loss. Most of you already know, but some may be uh, interesting statistics. I'll highlight some known facts about uh, cognitive impairment uh, and other comorbidities that come with uh, living with hearing, hearing loss. And then share with you some statistics on the adoption of uh, hearing enhancement devices. And I'll address uh, some opportunities to alleviate uh, stigma that has been historically associated with uh, in-ear devices. The work that, uh, that is going on in the industry in terms of uh, device designs, making the devices cool, and then multiple functionalities, uh, increasingly based on machine learning and artificial intelligence that uh, are finally getting these devices to be not the clunky old devices they used to be. And this is where I'm going to hopefully spend uh, most of the time talking about how the opportunity of transforming, transforming these senior devices with modern technologies, really cutting edge um, research and development that's going on in multiple sensor devices, um, and incorporating the sensors and really carefully designed artificial intelligence systems that are trained with um, data and um, continuous collection of data and the evolution of the systems, I'm going to highlight the opportunity to use these devices for continuous measurement of physical activities. I'll talk about utilizing machine learning to quantify social engagement versus uh, isolation and, uh, and loneliness, which is a big problem uh, for older population particularly. And last but not the least, I'm gonna talk about uh, a new area of research where we are integrating multiple physiological sensors to collect biometrics data and with the hope to develop an early warning system utilizing artificial intelligence, deriving health insights from continuous measurement of multiple physiological data. And I'll hopefully save some time for uh, discussion on collaboration opportunities, particularly a couple of projects 
that we are kicking off um, at Stanford uh, in a short order. And I request that Rob, please feel free to uh, interrupt me and uh, pitch in uh, uh, at any time that you feel comfortable and anyone else. So hearing loss and comorbidities, this is, uh, you should be very familiar with it already, but I'm going to share some statistics with you anyways. Uh, all data from World Health Organization, I believe this is more than three years old now, almost half a billion people have what's called disabling hearing loss. Uh, and it's people living with uh, 40 dB or higher um, hearing loss. Yeah, we take it, the numbers, you know, when, when you have to amplify the sound to 40 decibels just to barely hear, and then the amplification that's needed on top of that to make meaning of sound that you hear, it is, it is really disabling. I mean, for a good reason, they call it disabling hearing loss. And the prediction is by 2050, almost a billion people are going to have hearing loss. That's because a large number of young population are actually at risk of uh, hearing loss due to recreational sounds and all of the consumer electronic earbuds that they're putting into their ear, listening to music loudly and all of that. And then the data on the right, we can look at that as good news or bad news. The good news is we're going to live longer. 85 years old and, and older are the fastest growing population today. And actually 100 plus is the second fastest. So we are living longer, living healthier and eating better food. Uh, so that's the, that's the good news. And the bad news is then we're likely going to get hearing loss ourselves. Either we have some of that, but it's going to get worse. I'm going to show you in the next slide. But before I go there, uh, statistics from the industry. So there's about 17 to 18 million uh, hearing aids that are sold collectively between uh, about a half a dozen hearing aid companies. Uh, this data is from 2019. 2020 data we expect to be somewhat similar. So this is the, the, the bad data. So I borrowed this from Johns Hopkins. Uh, if you focus on the, the, the two bars on the right, you see that as we get over 70 years old, between 70 and 79, half of us are going to have hearing loss. And then as we get older than 80, almost all of us are going to have hearing loss. So it's uh, something that's come, that just as you know, it just comes with age. And uh, it's uh, our opportunity to help a lot of these people with our work. As far as the comorbidities, there is a, the fine prints down below. I'm going to distribute these things to you, whoever has interest. A lot of good research has gone on to establish the correlations uh, between hearing loss and a number of uh, physical health and cognitive health issues. I'm going to highlight a few of them. Data from Franklin has done a number of studies over the years, uh, has established that uh, mild, mild hearing loss between 25 to 40 dB of hearing loss increases the risk of cognitive impairment by as much as 2x. And moderate loss, that number goes up 3x for people living with severe hearing loss. It's almost five times chances of getting uh, some sort of cognitive decline. And of course, we know uh, from those of you that are in practice, it, living with hearing loss often directly leads to living in isolation. Uh, people don't hear well, they don't like to participate in conversations and uh, they tend to socially withdraw and spend time by themselves. And the loneliness is almost like a downward spiral for uh, all kinds of health issues, which le leads to cognitive impairment. This is an active area of research uh, around the world and a lot of good work is going on. There's a study that we hope uh, is gonna come out soon about trying to get to uh, causation studies rather than simply establishing correlations between them. Uh, but it's pretty clear that uh, uh, some of this co comorbidity is just uh, is explainable and makes sense. One other um, area I want to highlight is the uh, safe is the balance problem. Uh, studies have shown again this data is from uh, uh, CDC. People with even mild hearing loss have three times more likely to have a history with falling. Uh, balance, so we have balance problems even with mild hearing loss, and uh, it goes up from there. For every 10 dB of hearing loss beyond the mild hearing loss level leads to 40% uh, worsening of balance problems. As a result, we tend to fall down and hurt ourselves. I'm going to uh, refer to this uh, in the, as, as, I, as I come to the balance section of my talk. So with that, um, you know, many of you 
would tell me, uh, as I started talking with you back in 2017, a big problem, historical problem with hearing devices are uh, the, uh, our stigma, right? Uh, people don't want to be seen going around with uh, the old hearing aids and somehow, somehow there is the, the stigma stays on with us. So in fact, uh, I borrowed this uh, from 2006, uh, published in Stanford News. Uh, Dr. Jackler was uh, younger, um, but as, uh, as, 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 as uh, smart looking as now, because he was wearing uh, uh, eyeglasses. And he likes to say, you know, when you put on eyeglasses, uh, you look smarter, right? The perception people have around you is that uh, you gain smartness because you're not wearing glasses. On the other hand, here's what he, I quote him. He said, when you put on a hearing aid, you lose 30 IQ points and age 20 years. Uh, but he struck an optimistic tone back into 2006 that thanks to the technology trends, that's gonna change. In fact, you'll find within a few years, wearing a device in the ear will become as common as wearing a wristwatch. And uh, he also foresaw uh, grandma wearing a Bluetooth and being proud about it. So, so that vision was very strong. You know, uh, uh, it's just that technology is just about catching up, I would say over the last five years or so. And it has come to a point where we can make a lot of this uh, a reality. And I'm going to walk you through some of that. Just to have a little fun, and, uh, let's see if I can uh, elicit some interactions. Uh, anybody recognizes this uh, gentleman on the screen? I know Rob knows who he is. We had discussions about it. Anyone else wants to unmute the microphone and tell me who this is? Beethoven. Yes, thank you. Uh, so a lot of people. And so I had the pleasure of uh, visiting Bonn and uh, his home where uh, this uh, trumpet is still preserved. Uh, and your yeah, trumpet suddenly uh, was the hearing aids. As the technology progressed through the mid 1900s, we saw vacuum tube hearing aids with body worn devices. And even when uh, transistors came about, those devices still stayed uh, a little big. Well, they got miniaturized with the advent of digital signal processors and electromechanical sensor based uh, transducers for. Uh, microphones and speakers. But even then, uh, up until recently, the devices were still ugly. I'm showing you here a BT device that tends to be pictured a lot, unfortunately, in press, well, which is not really great for um, our profession and the industry. This is a BBC article explaining the shame that used to be back in 2009 about wearing hearing aids. And this picture uh, explains it all. So the good news here is that uh, over the last few years, I'd say three to four years, the industry has moved forward quite a bit. And these de de devices are starting to look and feel like uh, devices just purely based on industrial design. It's not so bad. So the pair of devices I'm showing here are made by Starkey, they are Livio AGI devices, but you can pick up hearing aids from any number of uh, uh, top five hearing aid makers, Phonak, Resound, Oticon, Signia, YDX, Starkey, I have to say collectively, the industry has moved forward quite a bit in uh, doing all of the consumer research uh, to look at uh, devices, how to make them look good, and also miniaturizing all of the components. Amazing work has been done on making them small. So if I was in the room now, I'd actually uh, ask you, did you, uh, did you recognize I am using, using these devices here? It's not fair because you're just looking at thumbnail pictures of me on the screen. But you know, as I get close here, I challenge you even in the room, most of the times when I present and I pull out my devices for folks that never seen, uh, they, they gasp and they'll say, wow, right? those are small little devices that uh, I didn't even know. I didn't notice you were wearing them. So they have uh, come to be uh, quite good in terms of industrial designs. And why do I use hearing aids? I don't have any hearing loss. I'll explain that to you a little later. And then we are also starting to see this merger between uh, hearing aid devices and consumer electronic uh, Bluetooth headsets. So this pair of devices that I'm showing you here, uh, and I'll hold up and show you the physical uh, device in my hand. Uh, they look just like another consumer electronics earbud, except these are full-fledged hearing aids with all of the advanced features and functions and programmability that comes with the post-oricular devices that I just showed you in the last slide. They are rechargeable, they are Bluetooth enabled, they stream, 
uh, audio from uh, the iPhones and Android phones into your hearing it is, is directly. And a lot of them have functions that you'd like to have them and rather than uh, uh, going about with uh, consumer electronic earbuds. In fact, I'll take a moment and explain to you why I use uh, hearing aids uh, in the next slide. Because I think that we are making strides with technology development in bringing a little bit about going beyond uh, uh, compensating for the deficit in hearing loss. And here's where you know, I had exciting conversations with uh, Rob uh, a couple of years ago and all of the visions about what can you do in terms of features, signal processing, utilize sensors and artificial intelligence and enable features that, that gives you superhuman uh, abilities. So you know, I'm using this term, I've been, been bombastically, but let me explain to you what I mean by it. So uh, the opportunity here is to embed computing technology in these devices, just because transistors got so small now, you can literally put 10,000 transistors across the diameter of a human hair. You can do a lot of serious computing with tiny chip that goes into the hearing aids. And we are now able to, without having to be connected with another physical accessory or a device, run real-time machine learning classification for understanding what kind of sound that are being collected through the microphones. And not the old ways of gathering sound and amplifying them by, by certain dBs that you measure with audiometry and uh, compensate for uh, the patient's hearing loss. But we are, start we are starting to get really smart about what sound should we be amplifying, what's speech and what is not. What's a wind noise? What's a, an annoying uh, truck passing by? Uh, what's vacuum cleaner that, uh, be, you know, the sound that's from a vacuum cleaner? When you're sitting in quiet or starting to have a conversation in a restaurant surrounded by people that you'd like to have a conversation with. So we are, we are able to now put technologies in there that in a tiny device, you can have multiple microphones to have directional uh, beamforming uh, combined with binaural signal processing and machine learning classifications of the sound to give me the ability, even with my normal hearing, to, to understand conversations better in a uh, crowded, noisy restaurant than I would be able to with my you know, perfectly normal uh, uh, hearing. Because I've gone through multiple testings and I still have the 20 dB line, uh, so I don't have hearing loss, but I still prefer to use my hearing aids because of two reasons. One is the ability to, amplify the sound of the world, right? You raise the sound of the TV when you don't hear well, well, I can raise the sound of the conversations around me. And with uh, directional microphones and machine learning capabilities, I can better understand speech in noisy environment than I can with my normal hearing. One more reason that I use this device for, I'm often um, having phone calls and meetings and listening to audiobooks. Uh, streaming video and audio from my phones. And you can get 24 hours of battery life with these devices. Uh, unlike your AirPods or consumer electronics earbuds that tend to run out of battery in three to four, four hours. So technology is start, starting to break through into becoming more than just compensating for hearing loss. So that's all I'm gonna talk about in terms of devices that are available already from you know, multiple companies in the market. I'm going to now switch and share with you some really exciting work that's going on uh, in the labs, in research uh, and prototypes and uh, starting to be feasible uh, to experiment with, really bringing, the, bringing different levels of capabilities with these devices. So this is a, a video I'm gonna show you uh, of our research uh, with multiple collaborations with uh, academia in pushing the, the limits of deep neural networks, really building a gigantic uh, uh, AI network and training that with tens of thousands of hours of human speech uh, to see if we can take what I call a speech signal out of an acoustic soup and discard the noise and present to, uh, to you the speech. Um, amazing work has been done with AI, as you know, in uh, radiology, in reading um, X-rays and MRI, to detect uh, medical health issues. People have done amazing work in recognizing face from uh, cluttered uh, visual scenes. So we challenged ourselves to, to take this to the domains of, can we 
clarify speech from a really noisy environment. So as I play this video, it's going to go quick. So you're going to see first, we're going to start capturing the sound in a uh, restaurant environment with a lot of people talking around. And then we're going to pass it through the deep neural network that has been trained with uh, speech data from a lot of talkers and speakers. And that's going to be able to basically understand what fricative transitions are unique to speech and should be kept, in fact, enhanced. And what sound is background noise and background conversation can be removed. So I'm going to play this and play, uh, please uh, get a sense of what's possible with these technologies. Green for the street and the direction. And the arrow is red. And I'm just staring at it for a moment, thinking, this is really strange. For a good two or three seconds, I'm seeing cars, two, three. So I hope you got a sense of what's possible with the latest uh, artificial intelligence technology. The first part of it was you could not understand anything that you were saying. I'll be happy to share this video with you, uh, those of you that would like to uh, play more with it. In fact, um, like to offer this as a collaboration area as well as we are really uh, pushing into trying and understanding what happens to older uh, patients with hearing loss, those who particularly complain about speech intelligibility and lack thereof. Uh, and hearing aids do not do a very good job for them, even after amplifying the sound. And I'd like to take this as a challenge uh, to understand the disabilities specific to speech understanding and how do we push the frontiers of deep neural network and other advanced uh, artificial intelligence algorithms to solve this problem for them. An example I would like to give you, it's a more recent example, of course, with uh, the advent of COVID, with, with COVID uh, uh, a, a uh, problem started uh, appearing in, in our industry and our patients in that a lot of people are complaining. You know, I already struggle to understand speech and I struggle even more when people around me are wearing masks. So we went to the lab and uh, tested these uh, masks, all kinds of different masks. I'm showing you here just uh, four charts, but actually we, we tested almost 50 different types of masks and their acoustic transmission properties. And yes, you can see here the Black line is the uh, the, nor the normal line, kind of norm uh, we normalized around uh, uh, speech, spoken language without wearing any mask when somebody is talking in front of you. And then we had different kinds of masks on the face of the speaker, talker, and then we recorded the audio and we clearly see the different levels of attenuations that happen. You can pay particular attention to from about two kilohertz to about eight kilohertz, which is six kilohertz, which is where most of the uh, consonants of speech happens to be, and really, uh, you know, six to eight dB of attenuation that happens. Obviously, patients wearing hearing aids are complaining about not understanding speech. So we were able to challenge ourselves to see if we can push the machine learning algorithms to purely based on spoken language around you, make an assessment of what sort of a mask someone is using, and then make appropriate corrections to the sound signal to help them understand speech. We call it uh, age artificial intelligence suddenly because all of the machine learning intelligence is happening on the device itself. And we're getting really good, uh, good uh, feedback about uh, people that are previously have been struggling to understand speech and have conversations with people wearing masks, but they're doing better now. So this is an area I'm really excited about solving problems with AI. Now let me uh, switch to the future. Transforming hearing aids with multifunctional into multifunctional devices. So here, um, I'd like to start with giving this uh, example that everybody gives. If you are going to talk about a device that has gone from single function to multifunction, there is no better example than what happened with phones. Uh, we were all, I loved my Nokia phone back in uh, 1998, 99, 2000. And uh, it, 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 it was an amazing device, allowed me to make a phone call, uh, a from anywhere, I did not have to be wired, but it only did one thing, allow me to make a phone call. What is it that we do not do with a smartphone today? It's my camera, I don't have to lug my uh, DSLR with me, it's my GPS uh, device, I don't have to carry GPS devices in my car or uh, in my bag, plenty of other things, right? So perfect example. The challenge is can we take in-ear devices and keep their great properties of 
amplifying sound, which is why people, our patients buy them and get them. It helps them uh, with something very important, communications with people. But could we incorporate new functions, turn them into multipurpose devices so that they will you know, steal a little bit of thunder from what smartphones have done to the phones? So here's where I borrowed a slide from Dr. Jackler. Uh, and you know, this is, uh, so he shared with me the vision that he had at Stanford Laryngology years ago. And I broke those into two uh, sections. And these images are, are just uh, copied exactly from Dr. Jackler's slides. On the left, this vision is about multiple applications. On the right is about incorporating sensors to turn these devices into biometric monitors. On the left, you see, can we have these devices not only amplify sound for you, but you know, could not just clarify sound for hearing, but could they be turned into uh, translation devices that would be connected to the cloud and help me translate, right? I could talk to my gardener uh, who speaks a different language, stream music information, you know, could they become an intelligent assistant for me? And as you see on the right, could they tell my body's core temperature? Uh, could they tell me my SpO2 level if it drops uh, below levels that I should be concerned about? Can they measure my pulse? Uh, and in, in fact, if you're dreaming about it, could they even non-invasively someday measure my uh, glucose levels? So I wanted to show this uh, just to show that the vision that uh, we all had, and I was proud to see this, and I'm going to tell you what we've done in the, in the engineering side to try and bring that vision to reality. So I'm showing you a picture of a device that we built with um, integrating multiple sensors inside the device. And they're really tiny devices as I've shown you. And uh, thanks to miniaturization of sensor technologies uh, and signal processing that allows us to build machine learning accelerators right on the, on the chip, we're able to do really amazing things. And I'm going to give you some examples of things that uh, we've been able to build. Yes, information. You can simply double tap on the ear. How can you double tap? Because we have integrated accelerometers in these devices. So if you double tap, that's an indication to the device that you are trying to ask a question. And uh, you could ask anything. What's the weather outside? And uh, who won the Super Bowl in 1982? Well, do you know who won the Super Bowl in 1982? So th there's, a, there's a reason I picked it because San Francisco 49ers de defeated the, the Cincinnati Bengals to, to win the first uh, Super Bowl back in 1980. So you, it can make you the smartest person in the room because you could simply double tap your ear and ask who was the 10th president of the United States? You don't, have to have, you don't have to know this information. So while that is gimmicky, what I'm really, uh, really uh, proud about is conversations we had with our older patients and they would say, it would be really useful if the device would remind me of my medications. Exactly when I'm, I'm supposed to take my, you know, one of my 10 medicines I take today. So all you have to do is double tap, sit down and program your device, ask it to remind you and it will. It will remind you of your medicines at the time that you want to be reminded privately in your ear. Uh, it will even help you find your phone if you lost it. Yes, language translation, we've been able to do that. People ask me, how fast does it work? So we've measured, in, measured the speed to be between 50 to 100 milliseconds uh, because we are running the, the, uh, the ASR, uh, automatic speech recognition and translation into the, in the cloud for it. But it actually works really well if you're patient with the device and all you're wanting to do is have a conversation with one person in front of you and that person speaks a different language. You can actually do a fairly good job once you get trained on it. It's going to get better. As you know, with 5G, the speed of communication with cloud is going to get faster. Really excited about it. Next, the same machine learning that we, are, we use to classify sound, we challenged ourselves, can we measure your social engagement? Well, as much as you want to know how many steps have you taken, if my mom is using hearing aids, I want to know if she has been socially engaged and she has been having conversations with people. How much she, has she had conversations or has she just uh, you know, spent time in her study room by herself? So uh, with uh, the machine learning, onboard machine learning, we're able to do that. Of course, with patient's permission, you're able to, with your caregiver app, you're able to see the data as well for the patient. Uh, Next, obviously, with the accelerometers built in for double tap and all that, we're able to measure your steps as well. And we can do that better than the wrist. The wrist, of course, has 
false uh, positives when um, you're simply flailing around your, your wrist in the ear is, the, is much better place for measuring physical activities. And uh, pushing it beyond just physical activity tracking, we challenged ourselves, can we reliably detect if the patients fall, as I showed, people with mild hearing loss have three times the propensity of falling down and it goes up from there. So falling down and getting hurt is a big problem. Uh, and we've been able to uh, use the accelerometer data in the ear to reliably detect falls. In fact, the comparative study have done in-ear devices do a better job with less false positives and false negatives than the usual pendant and neck worn devices that uh, people typically use for uh, emergency devices like fault detection. You can see there's a clear signature that we were able to derive from the accelerometers for simple walking pre-fall to when you're falling down, we can detect the impact and you know, we can detect, detect recovery from it. We have collected lots of good information and get, continuing to get better in terms of you know, learning from gait about what really happens here as, as you go about uh, walking around and we want to know what happens before you fall. And I'm going to come back to that as an opportunity for us to partner with Stanford to push this uh, frontiers forward. And um, you know, um, I hope I conveyed the excitement around this uh, because people fall a lot. In fact, just in the US, every data from National Council on Aging, every 11, 11 seconds an older adult is treated in emergency for a fall. Every 19 minutes, someone's dying from it. In fact, a shocking statistic is um, uh, from NCA again, NCOA, uh, half of the people have 50% older adults who are first time seen in emergency because of a fall related injury tend to die within a year. And it's all kinds of complications, but first fall is, could, could be really fatal for many people. Uh, and as excited as we are about being able to detect a fall when it happens, what I'm most excited about is the study that we are uh, about to do with uh, collaboratively with Stanford on learning about human gait and continuously analyze human gait to try and detect signatures that point to the need to, to improve their balance and guide them towards behavior, um, motion behavior that will not, uh, that, that will lead to them not falling and then actually save lives. Um, and here, I actually give this example, um, an engineer in me get uh, teary because I was, uh, when I was presenting about fault detection and our desire to build a product like that uh, and bring it to market, uh, when you eventually ended up doing that, an, an audiologist from Alabama called me up, you know, I went to school there, uh, that there was an older gentleman, heart patient, who had fallen in, in home and uh, he didn't have anybody uh, around with him. His son living in another city got alerted because the hearing device had automatic fall detector and the alert message is sent through the, uh, uh, through, through, uh, the cellular connection. And he called his dad, but he was not able to pick up the phone because he was unconscious. And the son called emergency help. They showed up at the gentleman's home. They were able to save him. Without that, he might have uh, passed away. So, you know, I don't know. It makes my our all our work really worth it, right? Uh, what is the, the price of saving a human life? I know you all do that all the time. But for an engineer, that is uh, really an uh, amazing fit for us uh, to be able to claim we can build technology that uh, save lives. Um, and I want to brag for a couple of uh, slides. Uh, the work that this work has noted, uh, Bloomberg published an article after uh, reviewing this product that the feature of wearable technologies should be a hearing aid. Because even if your ears are fine, this is quoted from the paper, um, you might want a device that translates languages, tracks fitness and monitors vital signs. Um, and uh, it got us some awards, including the Times Best Inventions and Consumer Electronic Award from consumer electronics industry uh, body, which I'm really proud about. But with that, as proud as I'm about that, I'd like to spend 10 minutes or so in really showing you a development system uh, that I hope we're going to uh, be able to productize uh, soon enough, but that's really an opportunity to take it multiple steps forward. And we challenged ourselves to to measure multiple physiological data from uh, in-ear sensors. Um, and that is body's core temperature, uh, heart rate, 
SpO2 respiratory rate. And we also are really close to be able to track uh, the accuracy that is required in order to get blood pressure. Um, and all of this actually have been in progress in terms of the technology development. We've gone from research in terms of the, the hardware technology and all the algorithmic capabilities that are needed to translate that data from the sensors to uh, physiological biometric parameters. A um, lot of very exciting results have been done uh, and obtained over the last six months or so. We are at a point where these devices are available uh, for collaborations to see what can do when you have real-time access to all of this data. I don't know of another uh, medical device that people are having with them all the time that will give you access to continuous measurement of all of these multiple physiological data. In fact, uh, uh, Stanford just, uh, I can, Michael Snyder's group published a paper on their work on Apple Watch. Um, I hope Flavio is on the line who forwarded me the paper. Um, that uh, did an amazing work just based on continuous sensing of heart rate and heart rate variability that you can calculate from continuous measurement of heart rate. They, did, they demonstrated they could have predicted 63% of the COVID patients that actually were, you know, a good number of people were part of the cohort, the study, even before they developed the symptoms. So just think of the possibility. You could predict pre-symptomatically respiratory problems just because they were just tracking their heart rate and heart rate variability. Now imagine all of the physical uh, healthy data we could collect if you have access to the patient's core temperature, heart rate and SpO2, respiratory rate on a continuous basis. Not to mention also the sound because we have microphones uh, in these devices as well that are continuously uh, hearing you. So with that, I want to show you some data from the lab just to uh, I'll leave you with, with the impression that these are fully working functional devices. I want to show you how it looks. It just looks and feels like you know a sleek in ear device that it would be no different from commercially available uh, in ear products of today. They're not ready to start shipping as products, but uh, what good are they? What good will be as products if we don't work together to make them useful uh, for people? So that's the opportunity. Is you can see here we can. Uh, reliably calculate body's core temperature within uh, plus minus half a degree of centigrade accuracy. Uh, and we made them robust enough such that you could go about doing your physical, regular physical activities and uh, still get accurate data. Uh, cardiac functions. So this chart shows our ability to measure heart rate really reliably with uh, uh, optical sensors that are built into these devices. And uh, again, the data is robust against uh, regular activities. It could be walking, running, jogging, sitting idle, and the device could be continuously uh, at, at the uh, rate of your choosing, the looking out for your heart rate and heart rate variability, et cetera, resting heart rate. Uh, and then this is where something we're really excited about because uh, we get, we're getting really accurate data compared to any other wearable devices that uh, we're benchmarked against. This is the results of a hypoxia study we've done with a, a lab uh, that shows our ability to track uh, blood oxygen saturation levels from nearly 100%, 97% to carefully designed study that shows we can track down to 65% or so and then you know, recover back up. Uh, this carefully drafted approved uh, hypoxia study we've done. Uh, and these are uh, in, in the late stages of uh, finalizing the robustness of the hardware but we're really ready for uh, medical studies with, uh, uh, with Stanford. So with that, I'm going to uh, wrap it up. I have one more slide to show, but I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes on, so what specifically are the collaboration opportunities here that we're so excited about? So um, uh, Dr. Jackler, I'm very, very really uh, 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 happy that he's uh, helping guide a lot of good conversations about new opportunities that open up when multidisciplinary research and development happen between engineers um, you know, like me and my team, um, engineers on Stanford side, we've got good collaborations with uh, computer science department, expertise, people with deep expertise in uh, most advanced uh, algorithms on machine learning and artificial intelligence systems. And then with the med school, 
it's really the opportunity to bring all of this together to see how can we turn these technologies into uh, health insights for people. So I've listed three bullets here. Number one, of course, is the bread and butter for us um, at the otolaryngology department. Uh, and that is to enhance hearing and speech. I have to say as good as these new technologies are, I hope you like the demos I showed you and I'm happy to meet with you in person and uh, do live demonstrations of these technologies. As happy as I am about those, I believe the best work in enhancing speech for the most challenging situations for hearing impaired patients still ahead of us. So I know uh, Matt is very, Matt Fitzgerald and his team, very passionate about speech and noise. He calls it SIN. Um, and there's re really great opportunities to collaborate and bring new technology to a practice there in helping people understand speech a lot, be lot better, which is why people buy uh, and get hearing aids mostly right, to have conversations and communications. The second part is new to the domains of hearing aids because nobody ever bought hearing aid because it could help you with your balance. But that's what happens when you take an old device, a traditional device and add new capabilities to it. We, we, with integrated accelerometers, we're really excited about, as I said, not only detecting when people fall, but we really want to assess people's fall risk. I've got mature prototypes uh, in my engineering teams that can be deployed for studies already um, in order to assess people's risk of falling by just looking at their gait and then helping them improve their balance. A lot of the practices you already have in balance centers and Christian Stinnerson and others uh, have helped guide some of the early conversations here on what goes on in terms of uh, what techniques are used in assessing people's fall risk in the practice today. And then once you assess the risk to be high, what do you do with the patient in order to improve their balance? And then the role that a device with built-in sensors can play in that, such that even after getting consultations in your office, they can go about their, their daily work and out in the wild, in their home, in their regular environment, you're able to collect insights um, uh, regularly as they're going about their work. So that's the excitement here. Can we help people prevent falls with continuous sensing? So with Dr. Jackler's help and Flavio is on board and a few others, um, Kristen and others, we have brainstorming is going on uh, next week. And I'm really excited to uh, push this uh, work forward and, and collaborate with, uh, with Stanford on what all we can do in helping people more than we have traditionally helped with the hearing aids. And then the third bullet is, uh, and I'll let uh, Rob add, add to it, I see that I unmuted his microphone. I'll uh, explain a bit about the third work and that is about the multiple sensors. Uh, as I said, these are research devices, not available commercially, but uh, that's the collaboration opportunity for us to design studies together and really go after the cohorts of patients that would benefit the most from being, uh, who we can help most by observing the trends in continuous trends in temperature, uh, SpO2, heart rate, et cetera. And of course, uh, 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 with uh, microphone speech as well. Can we go towards uh, de deriving health insights with AI based on the sensor data and go towards a, the dream of uh, an early warning system for people, right? They would know they need to go see you as doctor, right? So Rob, would you like to add uh, some things there before I move on to the next slide? No, no, I was just hoping uh, after you're done, there's a little time for comments uh, from everyone in the audience. Okay, good. So I'll wrap up with this slide here. Uh, and you know, in the spirit of collaboration, Rob already uh, mentioned, we are uh, joining hands to teach a class. I've been always passionate about um, uh, the, you know, what I call it computational perception. Uh, and for the last uh, four years, I've been spending all my life into the medical field, uh, collaborating with, uh, uh, with you all, and people like you. And this uh, course brings together the advances in technology and um, advances in bioscience together in really provocative conversations on what can you make possible in terms of not only compensating for people's perceptual deficits, not just uh, hearing and it's hearing balance, vision, uh, sensory motor problems, uh, not just, uh, not just uh, compensate for the deficits, but can we go towards the science fiction proclamations of uh, superhuman capabilities, right? Are we 
going to be able to go beyond our biological limits. And uh, Rob and I will, uh, we have done our uh, syllabus for it, the draft, and we're going to reach out to a number of you uh, to help uh, bring your expertise and passion into this uh, and co-lecture and give guest, guest lectures with us. So with that, uh, I'll let Rob and others uh, participate and you know, just, uh, I, mean, uh, I hope I saved some time for conversations. Thank you. No, uh, that was wonderful, Achin. Truly inspirational and that vision of wearable devices being part of an integrated series of connected uh, biometric devices that enrich our perception, enrich our communication. Um, this is clearly going to be a huge thing going forward. And uh, I'm just delighted to see you leading it. And I'm just thrilled to have you as part of our department as we partner together to imagine the multiple ways that a device on your ear linked together with other devices can make huge contributions um, uh, to the well-being of people and to enhancing life. So I, I think this is great to have, um, you know, our residents and faculty, uh, you know, join in the conversation and, and, and ask questions. Yeah, um, as a hearing aid user with significant hearing loss, I have been using hearing aids now for almost 25, 30 years. And uh, I have a new pair this year and uh, they're as um, unhelpful as all the other ones I've had. And I've had top of the line hearing aids all along uh, from the best companies. Uh, when are you gonna make a better hearing aid without all of this uh, other paraphernalia on it? That's a thank you for bringing that up, which is why I listed the enhancing hearing and speech as the first bullet because that is our core mission. Uh, and um, I, I, I'm, I, I completely understand what you're saying because uh, you know when I sit down with uh, with people, we still are not there where uh, we can we can understand speech in noisy environments better. In fact, what I'd like to do is, if you'd be willing, um, I'd like to. Uh, partner with you in helping you test some technologies that are not in commercial shipping devices, but we are exploring, uh, pushing the, the signal processing algorithms. That's a combination of how aggressive can we be about directionality of microphones, binaural signal processing, and then this advent of new algorithms based on machine learning in helping understand speech, and then really dialing it where it's the sweet spot for the individual patient, the individual wearer, on understanding speech versus natural conversations. And the reason I, would, I say that is um, when we process speech signal with machine learning and try and enhance speech, I can think of that as a dial from zero to 100. Zero where we do nothing on the, on the signal, simply amplify it. If you have 60 dB hearing loss, we amplify 60 dB. No, not good enough because it doesn't help with speech understanding at all. And then on 100, where nothing she's shipping in hearing aids today. But in the lab, we have results where we can be very aggressive about machine learning based enhancement of speech. And we give up a little bit of naturalness of the speech, but you'll understand the, the content of the speech well. And zero is not good, neither is 100. Probably somewhere in the middle, and we should be able, we need collaborations with people like you to help us help guide our technology that, you know, perhaps. You, I, I give you a system where you can dial up and down and say 60 between zero and 100 is where you have done the sweet spot in terms of uh, clarifying speech with machine learning algorithms, but it's still good enough that it sounds like human. So I'd love to reach out to you uh, and uh, work with you. And Rob is test piloting some of our current devices, but I'd like to work with you to see if we can get your advice and help us in the, in the technology development areas. I'm really optimistic about in the, what will happen in the next two to three years. I'm gonna take you up on that and uh, thank you for the offer. Absolutely, and <laughs> I'll take anything that'll help. Thank you. Yeah, so Peter and I tried to wear earbuds in a noisy restaurant as a sort of closed loop system so we could talk to each other. The problem is the latency is too long and it's like watching an old Swedish movie where the lips are moving off yeah. from the speech. It's very disconcerting. Yeah. So Rob, but, I have some good news in that. Uh, so you know, I left Intel and went to a hearing aid company. So we are pushing the, the chip technology there. We are embedding special accelerators for, for machine learning so that we don't have to off, off uh, load the processing function to a, an external device that is really not acceptable for real-time conversation. 
So that's why I'm so excited about next two to three years, what you can do. I have development systems that we can play with and, and get your feedback. Great, thank you very much, Achin, for that. Are there other questions or comments? Thank you so much for bringing this up. I just wanted to mention, I, I put the study in our chat, but I was um, really lucky to be involved with a lot of, um, with my co-resident Jason, who spearheaded the study, as well as um, awesome faculty mentors, who we looked at social perception of pediatric hearing aids. And I th we thought it was really interesting because I think what, this study it was a cross-sectional study that captured probably the current stigma against hearing aids among children. We found that those ch um, children who wore, this child or child mom who wore a hearing aid was associated with decreased, um, like associated uh, negative attributes with decreased, for example, athleticism and, and leadership. But the child, we also use a control with a child wearing glasses, which are far more representative in media. And children thought their child peer wearing glasses was more intelligent, more successful, and also friendlier. So I think it's really exciting to hear and see how the projection of media, intersection between media, celebrity, representation, marketing, uh, which, you know, with your industrial, you know, your, with your resources and your experience in industry will really influence and shape how society sees, you know, head and neck communication apparatuses. Uh, no question. I mean, when you put a pair of glasses in front of your face, you fundamentally change and alter your face. You stick something on your ear, you barely see it. But it's the old deaf and dumb stigma that's ending. You know, with the Bluetooth revolution, with wearing earbuds, it's changing rapidly to where, you know, you'll look at what you're wearing on your ear with a badge of technological prowess. Look, I've got the latest thing, just like you might show the latest phone. You know, the breakout for this is not only a better hearing aid and a multifunction hearing aid, it is a consumer wearable electronic device where you can improve hearing capabilities in normal people with normal hearing. I mean, this is what Achin was talking about, super hearing. You know, you can actually categorically improve the human sense of hearing in all sorts of ways, um, even in people without a disability. And once it's an instantaneous translator, once it will talk to you about the picture you're looking at in the in, in a museum, it will do a warn you when you try to cross the street and a bus is coming at you. And it's all sorts of things, access to information. It becomes a must have ordinary thing that you wear. And once, unlike eyeglasses or contacts or, uh, or surgery on the cornea, almost all of us who need that kind of help get it, high 90%. Hearing, it's maybe 20, 30, at most 35% of people who could benefit from today's hearing devices use them. But once these things become ubiquitous consumer devices, we simply build in them accommodations for hearing loss, particularly with the kinds of AI enhanced systems that improve signal to noise ratio. I mean, even healthy normal people go into a loud bar or restaurant and struggle in conversations. This is something you can imagine. You know, there are restaurants in New York where they'll give you reading glasses to read the menu. Someday we'll be handing out ear devices so everyone can talk to each other at the table with clarity and not getting rid of all the background noise digitally. Um, uh, and that kind of thing becomes very much imagined. And I think, although I discussed this 16 years ago in an editorial that I sent out to the residents and fellows shortly ago, I was a bit early, but I do think this transition is beginning to happen and gaining traction. And I really think Achen and his team are in the leading position of integrating all these expanded functionalities um, that will, I think, will eventually permeate um, to make wearing something on your ear, um, not just when you're out walking or riding your bike, but make something that you do ordinarily uh, all through the day. And oh, by the way, at night, because it can monitor your sleep pattern, right? And, and it can recognize snoring and things. So uh, as a biometric. Well, we are now just after seven, maybe one other quick question or comment, and then we'll uh, call it for the evening. I, I, sh I should have mentioned some good conversations have, uh, have happened with uh, Rob Capasso about the sleep checking. You mentioned that. Yeah. So we, we, we plan to do a sleep study on it at, at some point. Great. Well, uh, Achen, again, thank you and welcome to the department. I know you've been with us for better part of a year now, but you know, hopefully you've made a number of connections on top of the many that you already have. And we're just so grateful to have you part of our community. Thank you, Rob. It was a pleasure. I look forward to collaborating with uh, most of you. Right. And I look forward to our discussions. Take care. Thank you.
I'll, um, I'll, okay, there we go. Actually, I'll reach out directly to you. The uh, I got I've, I have a number of questions, of course, but <laughs> yeah, Matt. So yeah, sure. I, I can yeah, it, it, it's possible we have a few lines of overlap here. So I I'd be delighted to. Uh, um, we're overdue to talk again, you know. So let's uh, let's make that happen soon. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, I'll I'll set it up. Perfect. See you.